Hi, I'm going to be reading the third chapter of The Geography of You and Me. Upstairs, they spilled out into the darkened hallway, identical to the one 13 floors below. Both out of breath, Lucy had taken her sandals off somewhere around the 18th floor, and she let them dangle now from one hand as she used the other to feel her way along the wall. Aware of Owen a few paces behind her, his footsteps light on the carpet, at the door to 24D, she fished the keys from the pocket of her dress, then fumbled with a lock as he leaned against the wall beside her, squinting. It's not easy in the dark, he said, but she didn't respond. She'd been opening this door for nearly 16 years. She knew the incremental movements by heart, the way the key stuck so that you had to jiggle it to the left and the noisy click of the bolt as it finally turned. She could have done this blindfolded. She could have done it in her sleep. It wasn't dark, it was him. As the lock finally gave and the door swung open, Lucy hesitated. She realized she'd never had a boy in her apartment before, at least not like this, never alone, and certainly never in the dark. There had been friends of her brothers around, cleaning out the refrigerator and playing music so loud it thumped through the walls, but Lucy's school was all girls, so she'd never really had any guy friends of her own. Of course, she'd never had many girlfriends either. Last year, while making a rare and mandatory appearance as a chaperone at the winter formal, her mother had noticed that a few oblig obligatory dances, her mother had noticed that after a few obligatory dances, Lucy had disappeared into the hallway with a book. After that, she'd suddenly start, started paying attention to her daughter's lack of a social life. If Lucy wasn't hanging out with her brothers, she was usually just wandering the city by herself, neither of which apparently was a productive use of her time. And so she begrudgingly agreed to attend a basketball game where a junior named Bernie, who went to their, brother, to their brother's school, approached her at the snack booth to say that he liked her skirt. It was the exact same plaid skirt that every single other girl at the game was wearing, but he seemed nice enough and she had nobody else to sit with so she let him buy her popcorn. They started meeting behind the Metropolitan Museum of Art every day after school, doing their homework together just long enough to maintain the illusion that they weren't only there to make out. But never once had invited her over to his Fifth Avenue apartment, and never once had she considered inviting him back to hers. There was a theirs was a relationship built on neutral ground and impartial geography park benches and stone fountains and picnic blankets. Bringing him into her home would have given the relationship a weight that it was never meant to bear, and it seemed to Lucy that there was no faster way to sink something, especially something that would be, that would so easily sink on its own just two short months later, when Bernie met a different girl in a different plaid skirt at a different game. But this was a unique situation, an emergency of sorts, and that changed everything. An ordinary afternoon had given way to an evening that felt hazy around the edges, tinged with recklessness and a kind of unfamiliar abandon. This was the first time she'd been left entirely on her own, no parents, no brothers, nobody at all. And now here she was, swinging the door wide open, a boy she barely knew waiting at her back. From the front hallway, she could see all the way down past the kitchen and into the living room, where at this time of dusk, the windows were usually beginning to reflect the many lights of the city, the seemingly endless grid of yellow squares. But now it was empty, just a pale blue rectangle at the end of a long black corridor. Behind her, Owen cleared his throat. He was still standing just outside the door, apparently unsure whether or not he was being invited inside. So did you just want to grab the flashlight for me, or? No, Lucy said stepping aside, come on in. The fading light from the windows didn't reach this far back into the apartment, so Lucy kept her hands outstretched as she moved tentatively into the kitchen. Owen had wandered into the living room and she heard a scrape followed by a thud as he tripped over something. I'm okay, he called out cheerfully. I'm so relieved, she yelled back as she reached the pantry. On the bottom shelf, she found the enormous blue crate that held all the misfit items that never seemed to belong anywhere else. It was the one disorganized place in the whole apartment, a treasure trove of broken umbrellas and sunglasses, 
and an assortment of pens from various hotels around the world. She rummaged through the debris until she found a single flashlight, and when she clicked on it, she was glad to discover that it worked. Stepping out of the pantry, she swung the beam around the kitchen so that the light made shapes that lingered across the, back of the backs of her eyelids. In the living room, she found Owen standing at the window, his hands braced on the sill. When he twisted to face her, the cone of light fell directly across his face, and she lowered it again as he blinked. It's so strange out there, he said, jabbing his thumb behind him. It seems so quiet without all the lights. Lucy moved to the window beside him, her nose inches from the glass. The sky was a deepening blue and the checkerboard of windows, which were usually filled with glowing scenes of family dinners and flickering TVs, looked hunched and forsaken tonight. From where Lucy and Owen were standing, they could see dozens of buildings stretched across 72nd Street, all of them made up of hundreds of windows and behind them, thousands of people hidden deep within the folds of their own separate homes. It was always, it always made Lucy feel small, standing here on the edge of something so vast. But so, tonight was the first time it felt a little bit lonely too. And she was suddenly grateful for Owen's company. There was only one flashlight, she said, and he glanced down at it. She waited for him to make some kind of joke about being afraid of the dark. And when he didn't, when he simply remained silent, she added, so maybe we should just stick together. He turned back to the window and nodded. Okay, he agreed, but it's already getting warm in here. Want to go for a walk before it's too dark? Outside? Well, this is a pretty big apartment, but I just meant, I mean, do you think it's safe? This is your city, he said with a smile. You tell me. I guess it's probably fine, she said, and it wouldn't hurt to pick up some supplies. Supplies? Yeah, like water and stuff, I don't know. Isn't that what you're supposed to do in these types of situations? He dug around in his pocket and pulled out a few crumbled, crumpled bills. You can get as much water as you'd like, he said. I think a night like this calls for some ice cream. She rolled her eyes. It'll just melt, he said, but he was undeterred. All the more reason to rescue it from such a sad fate. Before they left, they checked their cell phones, but neither had any reception, and Owens was nearly out of battery. Lucy used what little power was left on her laptop, which had been sitting unplugged on her bed all day, to try to send an email to her parents, telling them everything was fine, but there was no connection. Not that it probably mattered anyway. It was six hours later there, and if they weren't still at some stuffy party, they were likely asleep. Downstairs, Lucy and Owen burst out of the blazing heat of the stairwell into the lobby, which was nearly as humid. They almost ran over a beleaguered looking nanny who was paused with one hand on a stroller, stealing, stealing herself for the climb. A few other people were milling around the near, near the mail room, sorry. But it seemed as if most of the residents were either upstairs in their apartments or, el or else tr still trying to find their way back home. The handyman who had helped rescue them was sitting at the front desk, his arm propped on his toolbox as he listened to the handheld radio. And he waved when he saw them. How are the stairs? Better than the elevator, Owen said. Any news? No power until the mar tomorrow at the earliest, he reported, his mustache twitching. They're saying it all it goes all the way down to Delaware and all the way up to Canada. He paused for a moment, then shook his head. It must be quite a sight from up in space. We're going to pick up a few things, Lucy said. You need anything? The man was in the middle of requesting a six pack of beer, which Lucy was about to tell him would be tricky to procure, given that they were both well under 21. When Owen tapped her on the arm, look, he said, and she turned out toward the front doors of the building, which faced out across Broadway. But instead of the usual herds of yellow taxis and black town cars and long city buses, she was so shocked to see that the entire road was choked with people, the whole massive crowd moving uptown with a kind of plodding resolve. Together, she and Owen stood in the doorway, their eyes wide as they watched the sea of bodies move past. Many of them were barefoot, their shoes tucked like footballs under their arms, and others had wrapped their shirts around their heads trying to keep cool. They wore suits and ties and dresses, and they carried briefcases and laptops, 
all of them taking part in the world's strangest commute. There were no traffic lights to guide them, no police in sight, though somewhere up the road, Lucy could see the faint throb of blue and red, unnaturally bright in the darkening sky. This is unbelievable, she breathed, shaking her head. On the corner, one of the bars was jammed with people, many of them spilling out onto the sidewalks. Whether they'd given up on their way home or simply wandered outside to join the camaraderie, there was a festive air to the gathering. High above them, perched on their balconies, people were using magazines for fans as they watched the scene unfolding below. Others hung out of their open windows, the apartments all dark behind them. It was like the whole city had been turned inside out. Come on, Owen said, and she followed him to the corner where a guy wearing a dusty construction vest was helping a man in a pinstripe suit direct traffic, holding up the throngs of people to let a few cars slip through the intersection, then motioning for those on foot to continue their long treks homeward. Lucy and Owen kept to the sidewalk, and when they reached their, the little bodega on 74th Street, which sold everything from cans of soda and toilet paper to dog food and lottery tickets, she grabbed his arm and dragged him inside. There were only a few bottles of water left, and they lined them up in a row on the counter before going back to grab a lighter and some candles, plus extra batteries for the flashlight. When Lucy pushed some money towards the man behind the register, he gave her what seemed like an unlikely amount of change. I don't think she began, but he flashed her a toothy smile. Blackout discount, he said matter-of-factly. Who knew, Owen said with a laugh. Think that applies to any of the ice cream shops too? The man nodded as he packed their items into two plastic bags. I heard the place on 77th is giving it away for free. It's all melting anyhow. Owen turned to Lucy. I think I like this city better in the dark. Outside, they stood for a moment with the plastic bags hooked around their fingers. The last streaks of pink had been erased from the sky over the Hudson, and an inky black, black had settled over the street as they walked uptown to join the line for free ice cream. There was still a feeling of celebration to the evening. The price of beer at the next bar next door was plummeting as the kegs grew warmer and on the other side of Broadway, a restaurant was serving a makeshift dinner by candlelight. A few kids ran past with purple glow sticks, and two mounted policemen steered their wary-eyed horses through the crowds, surveying the scene from above. As the line inched forward, Lucy glanced over at Owen, who was looking around with a dazed expression. You'd think there'd be looting or something, he said. In a place like this, you'd think it'd be mayhem, but it's just a big party. I told you it's not so bad here, Lucy said. Give it a chance. Okay, he said with a little smile, as long as you promise every night will be like this. What, she asked, dark? That's the thing, he said, looking up. It's not that dark, not really. She followed his gaze to where the silver of moon hung above the shadowy outline of the buildings, a thin curve of white against the navy sky that was dotted with stars. In all her years here, Lucy had never seen anything like it. A million points of light, all of them usually drowned out by the brilliant electricity of the city. The billboards and street lights, the lasers and sirens, the fluorescent lamps and the neon bulbs, and the great white noise of it all, which left no room for anything else to break through. But tonight the world had gone quiet. There was nothing but the black canopy of the sky and the wash of stars above burning so bright that Lucy found she couldn't look away. He was right, she murmured. This must be quite a sight from up in space. Owen didn't answer for a moment, and when he finally did, his voice was hushed. I don't know, he said. I think it's even better from down here. That's the end of chapter three. Thanks for watching.